welcome back to Whiteout Weekly on our first glorious victory week as the Nittany Lions take care of business 38-15 against the Mountaineers. They even covered the spread and the total went over on that late Bo Pribula touchdown run, which lost my under bet on the Big Ted Bank Bonanza, but who really cares about that? But only was, six seconds to spare. Six seconds to spare, and you were <laughs> at the game. So how was that? Wild environment, as we stated. Sneaky, sneaky whiteout. Uh, you could barely notice the the helmet stripe there, but uh, raucous crowd. Uh, only feedback I have after, I know I typically go to a game a year, but a uh, lot of renovation talks with Beaver Stadium. That sound system definitely needs an upgrade. Sounds like... Uh, you know, when someone's blasting music too loud in their car, uh, yeah, yeah, and the bass is just way too heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty similar, but uh, overall, uh, yeah, that crowd was ready to roll. I think it was fourth largest crowd, Beaver Stadium in history, 110,000 and some change. So it, we were, uh, crowd was ready to go from the jump. So I'm definitely not mad at Peter Bula for scoring his first collegiate touchdown, but I'm sure. The Michigan coach had something to say about it. Yeah, Neil Brown, uh, I believe, Michigan, was post. Did I say Michigan coach? West Virginia. I knew what you meant. West Virginia coach. <laughs> yeah, Neil Brown, uh, who obviously now off off to a not a good start, zero and one when he was already heading into the season in hot water. Uh, had some comments about Franklin's decision to continue to keep the foot on the gas there towards the end of the game. Uh, Brown basically said that if he was in that spot, he would have handled a little differently. Um, but ultimately that he's not worried about it. That's, that's karma. That'll come back around. Uh, Franklin, of course he would have handled differently. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, he wishes he was in that position. Yeah. Uh, but Franklin responded today. I think he responded pretty well, but he basically said that his job is in that situation to get the twos or second stringers into the game, especially when West Virginia still had the majority of their ones in, and to get them meaningful reps uh, and to allow them to have an ability to execute and run the offense when he was speaking of Bo. Uh, And he said West Virginia was running, which they were, uh, a ton of cover zero in that last possession, uh, which is hard to run against. Uh, so we gave him an opportunity to kind of check and make some reads that would work against that cover zero offense. And basically Franklin ended with, he's all for uh, what, what they did. And I have to say that I agree with him, um, especially when West Virginia does that snow globe bullshit towards the end of the game uh, mm-hmm. for that two point conversion. You got to expect that that's going to leave a, a poor taste uh, in your opponent's mouth and they're going to want to jam it right back down your throat. So uh, that seems to be where it was left at. Ultimately, we came out on top. So Neil Brown's comments uh, don't really hold much sustenance. But yeah, uh, don't care. Two the two quote uh, two coaches kind of squabbled and we consider it to be squashed. I think at this point. Yeah, I mean it, it's a good call on Franklin's part. They're still playing their ones. You got your twos going basically against a mid level collegiate team that those are meaningful reps late in that game so yeah i mean who cares about your feelings the uh other thing i saw that caught my eye daquan hardy i mean vanover kazai izzard and amari evans were all absent in week one and during the broadcast, they said Franklin hasn't ruled Hardy or Izzard out for the season, which scared me. Yeah, this was really found out pregame. Uh, I believe the Big Ten has some new rules in place where teams have to provide their availability chart or availability uh, list. Um, so basically players who won't be suiting up or won't be participating in the action. Uh, I believe it's 30 minutes to kick off. So the Amari, Amari Evans and Daquan Hardy one definitely caught a lot of folks. I know it caught me uh, by surprise yeah. uh, being in the stands, to be honest. I didn't wait I didn't 30 notice. minutes. They, that's when they give the injured list. I believe it's 30 minutes to kick off. They have to release to the media uh, who's available and who's not. That's insane. 
Yeah. That, like that means that you have to wait 30 minutes to bet a game now, essentially. Perhaps, yeah. If someone's if someone's like hampered or and they're questionable and you don't know if they're mm-hmm. gonna suit up, yeah. What the, the third, that's that's whack. But uh but yeah, uh I think the biggest biggest one there, obviously Omari Evans, who we talked about uh, in our first pod about him potentially stepping up in the bigger role this year. But Hardy, uh, he was definitely missed, but I think it created a nice opportunity for Cam Miller, uh, yes. who I believe showed out uh, in a big way this game. And also uh, Johnny Dixon, in some instances, was able to slide over uh, from his number two corner spot into the slot. Um, it allowed them to push Cam and some other guys out to the side. So I think you learned a lot with Dixon where he's got that versatility to play as a number two shutdown corner, but also inside um, and just allow some other guys to get a lot of playing time. And then also in the wide receiver spot with Evans out, uh, they were able to continue to spread the ball around to some uh, some guys that we didn't expect to see to get that much action. Um, so I think McClain. overall, yeah, Malik that was, McClain, that was great uh, to, say. to name one. Yeah. That was great to see him because the transfer from Florida State just getting right into the action. So Cam Miller targeted four times, only gave up three receptions for 28 yards. Long of 17. So 17 of those 28 came in one pass. That's Mm -hmm. pretty freaking good. So we'll move on to the big story. We, according to all the different blogs, we now have Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. So that's pretty awesome. Two-time Super Bowl MVP playing quarterback for us. <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, Drew Aller exceeded every expectation I think people had of him. And that's now, that's now becoming the standard for these recruits. We saw it last year with Abdul Carter, Keyshawn Allen, Nick Singleton. Saw glimpses of what Aller could do, but we didn't see that pocket presence, accuracy, and arm strength on full display for a full game. And it was beautiful to watch. Yeah, I think you just you just have a different out element at the quarterback spot with him back there. I mean, t- hard to ask for much more from a kid in his first career start, uh, especially I know it's at home, but in that type of environment. Um, but through for 300 plus three touchdowns, just had a poise about him in that pocket, just cool, calm, collected, but also yeah, uh, showing off that arm strength. I mean, even right out the gate with those screen passes. His ability to get it out there quickly to extend the field and get the speed uh, out wide was huge. And then just to put his stat line in perspective from what we've been accustomed to the last several years is Sean Clifford only threw for 300 plus yards and three touchdowns only once. And that was against Maryland in 2021. And I believe about 240 of those yards were to Jahan Dotson. So for him to put up that type of stat line in his first start and to spread the ball around to nine different targets just shows, uh, you know, his his big time ability. And he's just got that arm strength, his ability to step up in the in the pocket, extend plays and still get the ball to where it needs to be is just something that this team hasn't had. Uh, And it's really, really exciting uh, that this is only the beginning of the Drew Aller era. And it uh, it's going to be a fun it's going to be a fun ride. That's what I was going to say. Um, his pocket presence, like mm-hmm. he's not just like scrambling out of the pocket, and making throws on the run, just like running straight right, straight left. He's like agile in the pocket, stepping up, creating lanes for himself to create those throws and those throwing lanes to his receivers, which is, I mean, just far and beyond what a sophomore should be should be capable of. And I think I only counted two or three times where, and I love this sophomore quarterback where he gets in the shotgun, checks the defense. And if he sees a check or a a audible, that's going to work, goes up to the line, tells everybody, tells the running backs, gets the wide receivers on the same page. And it worked to a success rate. I think we only missed 
we didn't have a positive bite on like two or three of those. So that IQ was end the play. It was just awesome to see. Can't wait for it to keep going. He won the uh, Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week in his first collegiate start. So sky's the limit for this kid. Uh, last thing I'll say about this game is J.B. Nelson going in late for the sadly retired Landon Tangwell. Gave up some pressures, but overall he was tremendous in the run game. Yeah, uh, definitely was a huge presence out there. Um, obviously sad to not have Tangwall suiting up there, but I think he filled in very, very nicely. Um, and then the last couple notes that I have on this game as well, just to kind of wrap up, is tight ends weren't involved at all in this game. So going back to yeah. Aller's ability to spread the ball around, the fact that only one target or, sorry, one catch – uh, one completion went to the tight ends. It was Tyler Warren very early on for nine yards. Yeah, uh, Theo Johnson was – I guess it was just blocking. Yeah, yeah, provided uh, a lot of great blocking. Uh, Khalil Dinkins, I think, uh, threw a big block on that T formation touchdown run from Singleton. So uh, they, they were non-existent on the stat sheet, um, but they provided a lot of great blocks out there uh, on a lot of those plays. Um, and then the other note I had was just from a snap count perspective. So at the safety position, which you, we talked about as a big time position battle, Jalen Reed and KJ Winston ended up getting the starting nods, but the snap counts uh, were dispersed pretty evenly. Reed got the was the bell cow of 46 snaps, Keaton Ellis with 36, Winston with 35, and Zaki Wheatley, who had a very sneaky good game, uh, played 34 snaps. So continue to see a lot of those guys or expect to see a lot of those guys continue to filter in. So the starting nod with Reed and Winston getting the starting nod didn't truly equal out from a snap count. Those guys still got a ton of time. So be interested to see uh, a lot more from those guys against a more for, uh, a weaker opponent in Delaware. For sure. Before we get to the Delaware preview, let's go around the trenches, a.k.a. around the Big Ten. Trenches on three. One, two, three. Trenches. Woo! That regular gas. We run diesel premium only. The hot, hot. Voice crack on the snap. Personal file. 69. Offense. He was giving them the business. We we'll start at the top. Michigan handled their business. J.J. McCarthy was PFF's fifth highest graded offensive quarterback in all of college football against Eastern Carolina. They have a truly dangerous offense with that duo of Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards, who's a weapon of the passing game. And then they have seniors at wide receiver, Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson. So they're a scary, scary team. Um, Ohio State, despite their freshman quarterback, they just have too many weapons, even though Marvin Harrison looked shook up. I think he injured his shoulder and had to exit, but came back, looked like he was in serious pain, but then their tight end, Kate Stover, just kind of took over. Absolute matchup nightmare. The one thing I did notice, though, they're also very strong on defense. Mm -hmm. Probably the strongest front four in the Big Ten. They rarely blitz because they can just rely on those four to create pressure. The one thing I did notice, though, week O line. McCord was getting pressured a ton. So that could be something to exploit when we play them. Maryland wins Talia in true in true uh, Tagovailoa family fashion. Looked hurt. He was like kind of shaking his throwing hand all game, but was just on fire the entire game. Three touchdowns, no interceptions. And this might be my favorite game around the trenches. The Purdue bad beat against Fresno. Did you see that game? 
or see the highlights or anything. So Purdue is Purdue's down. 32, I think it was 32 20. They're down down touchdown, I think. Mm -hmm. Or maybe six points. Fresno State has the ball. They throw an interception. Purdue gets it, scores in two plays, and now they're up. Fresno State gets it back with like four minutes, a little over four minutes, and score a touchdown on like a seven play, 79 yard drive. Leave Purdue 59 seconds and they turn it over on downs. Oh, man. So they end up losing to Fresno State. That spread was Purdue minus two and a half. And I was looking at Fresno State as a potential pick. Bad Last two. In the Ryan Walters era. Oh, dude, brutal. Are you kidding? <laughs> one, of the, one of the worst beats of all time. Because they were up pretty much all game. Yeah. Last two. Wisconsin handled their business. They went against what we thought they were going to do with their new quarterback, Tanner Mordecai. He actually threw two interceptions. But they went with the ground and pound. And absolutely gashed in week one. So their Wisconsin's running game is going to be a problem. And last but not least, Iowa beats Utah State, who was missing their best defender, their nose tackle, the heart and soul of their defense. So, I mean, barely a win. They won 24-14. Doesn't even matter. And then we have Penn State's humongous win before big bad Delaware comes down which I've been looking online and I can't find a spread anywhere Dave yeah it seems to be I would would take minus 50 I was going to say 50 55 somewhere in that ballpark I think the Penn State could probably cover the over by themselves. <laughs> so I know their head coach, Ryan Carty, former Blue Hen quarterback, is now entering his second season. They lost their star quarterback, Nolan Henderson, to graduation. But I don't know too much about this team. <laughs> I mean, I looked at their week one. Uh, opponent. They won 37 to 13 on the road against the Stony Brook Sea Wolves. Sea Wolves. Sounds that's like a minor league baseball team. Wait, is that? I need to look this up. Is that a made up thing? Sounds like they're a double A affiliate of someone. Yeah, it really does sound like. Oh, they're real. The Vancouver Island Wolf, also known as the Coastal Wolf or Sea Wolf. Is a subspecies of gray wolf endemic to the Pacific Northwest. Isn't Stony Brook in New York? I believe so. Why is it? The Vancouver, they're up in the Pacific North, whatever. But Sea Wolf, that's a thing. All right. Learn something on this podcast. But in that National game against. Geographic coming at you. <laughs> again, that game against the Sea Wolves. Uh, <clears throat> The running back, Marcus Yarns, ran for two touchdowns, 107 yards on 11 carries. That's 9.7 yards per touch. Their quarterback, Ryan O'Connor, the newly minted quarterback, had a touchdown, but also threw two interceptions and had eight different players catch two or more passes from him. That's about all I got besides a little bit on some mismatches. But anybody that we shouldn't be looking at as impact players for Delaware. I think really uh, just comes from the wide receiver spot. Uh, They got a couple guys who had some nice games last week. Again, got to take the competition into consideration. But with that being said, you got Chandler Harvin. 6'2 target, 195 pounds. Uh, and both these guys, mind you, are transfers. So transferred into the program, uh, likely for just a spot at some more playing time. But Chandler, 
Uh, transfer from Sam Houston State, uh, four catches, 128 yards, three touchdowns uh, against St. Francis last year. So he proved that he can produce five catches for 100 yards last week. And then Kim Wimberly, who's a Harvard transfer, second team all Ivy last season, five passes for or five catches for 81 yards and a touchdown last week against the mighty Sea Wolves. Really look for them to uh, use the screen passes a lot this week would be my best hunch. And based on Franklin's press conference uh, today, that's what he would expect as well to get the ball out into space to these guys. And then anytime they get an FCS versus FBS matchup, I would expect to see some funkiness um, in regards to different formations. I know Penn State gonna, teams do it because yeah. we utilize the T formation, but just doing some different things uh, early on to kind of mix it up and keep this defense uh, guessing. So that would be kind of my best estimate on how they're going to approach this. Uh, but ultimately, from a sheer talent level, it's just no comparison, uh, obviously, between the two schools. Over under one and a half trick plays from Delaware before I, I give take the Sea Wolf fact. <laughs> I would take the over on that. Yeah, same with me. I should have made it two and a half. <laughs> so they're they have a semi aquatic lifestyle, which includes a diet that is almost entirely marine based. So mm. they're pescatarian. Weigh sixty five to ninety pounds, four to five feet from nose to tail. Sea wolves, pretty cool. Am I, huh? I just rose up my favorite animal rankings. I have some fun facts to take to your next family barbecue. So the mismatch I'm looking for is in the trenches. O-line versus D-line. That should just be a complete weight mismatch. Stony Brook even gashed them for 164 yards on the ground last week. 5.5 yards per attempt. I think Nick Singleton and Katron Allen both might come close to 100 yard games. Mm-hmm. And then lastly is again in the trenches, but more specifically on the edges. Well, their, their left tackle, Blaze Sparks, and their right tackle, Fenton Bros. Some <laughs> great some names there. <laughs> Eddie Lax names for some tackles yeah. uh, against Chop and Adisa. So, uh, Fenton Bros, that is such a lacrosse name. Is Adam yeah. Cole. is 6'2, 304 pounds senior. Last week, he allowed three pressures on 52 pass blocking snaps. While again, another incredible lacrosse name, Blaze Sparks. He's 6'7", 322 pounds, transferred from Illinois in 2021. He let up two sacks against Stony Brook last week. So I did notice last week that Adisa and Chop didn't get as involved uh, in the QB pressure game. And it part of it on the plays I saw was the center pulling over one-on-one blocking one of our defensive tackles and then the guard and tackle pulling over and doubling either Chopper or Adisa. Mm-hmm. So I think Delaware might employ the same blocking scheme given those across tackles. But I think we get over five sacks this game either way. Yeah, I think I think last week, Garrett Green, surprisingly, I know we labeled him or kind of talked through where he's a dual threat. He did provide a lot of shiftiness in the pocket. And, he did. Uh, there was yeah, some, he, some like, missed opportunities. He ended up, I think he, I believe he ended up with a, about 70, 75 rushing yards. Uh, so he provided or proved to be uh, difficult to bring down. I think this will be a different story this week. So, yeah, I think I expect a lot of these guys that you mentioned, Chop, Adisa, I throw a duel in there. I expect a lot of them, or at least each of them, getting one, uh, getting home uh, this week and finishing the job. And speaking of Abdul, I love the uh, Zaki Wheatley's. I think his dad's response mm-hmm. to our tweet. He's like, "Everyone 
all the casuals saying he had a bad game because of a few missed mm-hmm. tackles. Like he, he had a huge impact on that game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had a few missed tackles, but that's going to happen. Every yeah. great linebacker has the tackles. It's what you do to affect the game that makes you great. And he had a great game. Mm-hmm. Speaking of not so great, we went 0 and 6 last oh! week in the Big Ten betting bonanza. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! We've won, you know. We're getting our feel for these teams. But wow, what a fucking dud. <laughs> oh, and six. And then I had oh. my Sunday Northwestern money line. I'm just like, this, I'm just going to, I bet Rutgers. So I was like, dude, this is going to lose. Like, we're just <laughs> off. But that just means a rebound has to go back to the mean in this week's edition of the greatest betting competition on planet Earth, the Big Ten betting. Bonanza. Week two of the Big Ten betting Bonanza. And before we start, just going over the rules. If you hit a spread game it's plus one you can't take any money line favorites if you hit an underdog that's plus three and if you hit an underdog that is six and a half six and a half points or more you get plus five and any double digit underdog is going to be a plus seven so like a plus four you know 350 to 500 type range Long bomb. And also, I have to mention, so right before the Colorado game, I threw 150 bucks on them money line and then $5 on Travis Travis Hunter to win the Heisman. $5 to win (laughs) 1,500. Check it today. He went from plus 30,000. I got him at plus 30,000. He's now plus 3,000. So if I, can, if I can turn five into 1,500, <laughs> that might have to count towards this. <laughs> I would be like an absolute genius. I don't think that's in the bylaws. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not, not in the Big Ten bylaws. Um, but, I mean, I'm going to let you go first because both of us suck. So let's see who's, who's going to make the first losing pick this week. Yeah, uh, I wish I could say that we're just starting in week two here. I uh, want to forget last week. But uh, with that being said, with the Travis Hunter. Know. All right, all right. I'll, I'll take the 0 3 start. I'll, I'll roll with it. <laughs> with that being said, uh, I am all on the Dion hype train. So we got Nebraska at Colorado. Over under 59 and a half in this game. Uh, but more interesting, the line, we got Nebraska. This line has moved a ton since it opened. I believe it opened at Nebraska minus two and a half. It's now at Colorado minus three. Uh, I am going to go open at Nebraska favored. Nebraska favored in this one. At Colorado. Going to at Colorado. Colorado. And it since shifted. Uh, I'm going to jump on it before it shifts a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and take the buffs minus three. At I knew you're, against the I knew you're gonna, that was going to be my pick, but now I'm, now I'm a little worried about that. I think if you learned from last week, it's. I mean, any, any time it crosses over zero, it's never a good sign. I am also going to go with a non-conference team to come in and smack one of our weaker opponents. I'm going with Kansas minus three on Friday night at home against Illinois. I like it. I'm just going off of what I saw last week and 
to flip them through. Saw a couple series from Illinois. Not impressed. Haven't seen Kansas play, so let's roll the dice. All right. I wish we had this Penn State freaking spread. I know. I'm interested to see what it is, too. All right. I am going to go. Speaking of a rough start to the Ryan Walters era, uh, Purdue is headed to Blacksburg to take on the mighty Hokies. You mother. That's. Uh... I don't believe that. After, Purdue... I, after I just explained their, their bad beat, the, the entire <laughs> scenario, they're going to take the pick from me. I don't believe they're going to start off 0-2. I am going with the Boilermakers to, with the underdog money line. They're plus three in Blacksburg. Give me the Boilermakers. Boiler up. Yeah. Am I just stealing your picks all year this year? Wait, wait. You're going Boilermakers there? I'm going Boilermakers. Oh, money line. Money line, baby. What, what is the money line? Uh, plus 122. They are three point underdogs. Plus one, two, two. Guess what? I'm taking Virginia Tech minus three. Oh, Let's duel. Go. Let's go. <laughs> I totally. Oh, my God. I thought you were going to go all day there. Nah. That was uh, your whole speech. It felt like it was leading up to a, a Purdue. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, I um reason I'm picking Purdue, they yeah, they were winning all game, but their defense is very suspect. Mm. They have a decent quarterback, little inaccurate, um pretty much one main wide receiver in Deion Burks. So mm. I can see a team like Virginia Tech stepping up and Taking them down at it's where is it? Where is it at Virginia Tech or at Virginia Tech? Yeah, yeah, I'll take them at home minus three all day. Your last pick, all right. Last one. I'm they didn't fare me well last week, but I'm going back to the well with the Michigan Wolverines. Gonna steer clear of a total this week, no deep, uh, goals. but I'm gonna go with the big line here. I got Michigan at home. Game two without Harbaugh. Uh, they're going against the UNLV Rebels. I uh, got Michigan minus 36 and a half. Big favorites in this one, but I think they cover. I got minus 36. So. 36, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. So you can push that possibly. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do three straight out of conference teams. To be down on the Big Ten this year, and guess what? It's against my least favorite Big Ten team, Iowa. Iowa, Ooh. Iowa State. Iowa State is plus four at home. Let me see what the money line is. Plus four is pretty good because that could turn into a. Battle for the Cyhawks. Let's say let's say plus. I'm not, yeah, let's say plus four. Let's let's get points on the board. So my last pick will be Iowa State plus four. So to recap, Dave Colorado minus three and a half. Purdue money line plus one twenty two. So that's a shot at a a plus three, right? Mm-hmm. And then Michigan going back to Michigan minus 36. <laughs> My picks Kansas minus three against Illinois, Virginia Tech minus three against Purdue, Iowa State plus four against Iowa. So I'm picking a down week for some Big Ten teams in week two. And that will do it for week two of our podcast. Thank you guys so much. Once again, for listening, subscribing on YouTube, following us on social media. We absolutely love to do what we do, and we're going to keep it going until the wheels fall off. And it's looking like it's going to be an electric, electric mm-hmm. season. Cannot wait. I was watching Kick and Screaming Beyonce song. 
Feel the electricity in the air. <laughs> That's how I feel right now. But it, once it. again, thank you so much. This is Matt Martellucci signing off from Whiteout Weekly. Thanks, guys.